The question is, when is the performance of a contractual obligation due? Most contractual promises are not independent of each other. Rather, contract law assumes that parties to an agreement have an expectation of an exchange of performances. In other words, the law will imply that mutual promises are conditions concurrent to each other when they can be performed simultaneously, and the law will imply that one promise is a condition precedent to the other when they must be performed sequentially. The doctrine of substantial performance and material breach holds that performance of one party under an exchange of promises is due when the other party has substantially performed. If a party has not substantially performed, we say that party has materially breached. The breaching party may have a cure period of time to remedy its failure, during which the other party may withhold its performance. When the cure period expires, the uncured material failure becomes a total breach, and the other party may then terminate the contract. In this lesson, we're going to focus on the effect of performance and breach. This builds upon our understanding of the forms of performance and breach, so we'll briefly review those before moving on to the black letter law on the effect of these states of performance. There are four states of performance that have legal relevance here. The first is complete performance, which is full performance of an obligation as detailed in a contract. The second is substantial performance, which is performance of the primary, necessary, and material terms of an agreement where the failure to perform the remainder of the obligations was in good faith, or at least not in bad faith. Material breach is when the failure to perform is the result of bad faith or where the material part of a contract has not been performed or delivered. And total breach is a state where it is no longer possible to cure the failure of the material breach either because of the grievousness of the breach itself, or because the party has indicated it will not cure, or because it has simply run out of time to cure because it would be unreasonable to ask someone to wait that long for the performance to be substantial, to be made substantial. Complete performance satisfies all conditions, both express and implied. It means that the other party has to perform its due under the exchange of promises, and the party who completed performance has no liability. In other words, from Restatement Section 235, Paragraph 1, full performance of a duty under a contract discharges the duty. Under the rule stated in Subsection 1, a duty is discharged when it is fully, completely performed. Nothing less than full performance has this effect. Only complete performance will discharge a duty, meaning will remove the party from any further obligation or subject that party to liability for breach. It doesn't matter why there has been a defective performance. Although a court may ignore trifling departures, performance that is merely substantial does not result in discharge of the duty. Only complete performance will discharge a duty such that the completely performing party has no further liability or obligations to act. Substantial performance is something less than complete performance, and it occurs when the material elements of the contract have been met, the reasons for the contract to be entered into have been fulfilled, and the party receives, for the most part, the benefit of the bargain that was expected. But performance is not perfect. When performance of a duty under a contract is due, any non-performance is a breach. In other words, substantial performance is a type of breach. There is a breach to the extent that the performance is not complete. Note that a substantial performance will not discharge a party's obligations, and any failure to perform those obligations can result in damages for that failure and to the extent of that failure. However, when a party has substantially performed, the other party's obligations become due. So we see here we have to separate liability for breach from whether or not the other party must perform. 
Material breach is a state where conditions are not satisfied because the material effect of the contract has not been met. The party who did not receive the material benefit of the bargain may withhold their performance until receiving that benefit. And the party who breaches may be liable for this breach. Even if the breach is cured, even if the performance is made substantial, there may still be some damages because of the delay. This is the heart of the matter, and determining whether or not performance has risen to the level of substantialness or has fallen below the level of material breach is the essential question to determine whether or not the other party must perform its obligations. Determining whether a failure is material or whether performance is substantial is a question for Restatement Section 241, which talks about the significant circumstances under which courts will evaluate whether performance has been made substantial or not. In determining whether a failure to render or to offer performance is material, the following circumstances are significant. And note, we now have a five-part balancing test. A, the extent to which the injured party will be deprived of the benefit which he reasonably expected. B, the extent to which the injured party can be adequately compensated for the part of the benefit of which he will be deprived. C, the extent to which the party failing to perform or to offer to perform will suffer forfeiture. D, the likelihood that the party failing to perform or to offer to perform will cure his failure, taking account of all of the circumstances, including any reasonable assurances. And E, the extent to which the behavior of the party failing to perform or to offer to perform comports with standards of good faith and fair dealing. Restatement section 241 might be graphically illustrated, as you see on your screen. On the one hand, we have obligee's issues. The obligee is the person who was to receive the benefit of the bargain. The obligor, on the other hand, is the person who was to provide the benefit of the bargain. Give you some context, think about the case of Jacob and Young v. Kent. Jacob and Young were the builders. They were obligated to create a house. And Kent was the obligee. He was to receive a house, and his obligations would only become due if he received the house that was promised. So in that instance, Kent was the obligee whose obligations, he would only become an obligor if there was substantial performance by the original obligor. In any event, I think that the test in section 241 can be more easily visualized when you note that there is a balance here. 241 focuses first on the obligee's deprivation, whether or not the person received the material benefit of the bargain that they expected. But it balances this against the deprivation and the forfeiture that the obligor will suffer if the obligor is not paid for the work. The obligee's remedies at law are also considered because if the obligee cannot be remedied at law, then what would be the value of issuing a decree? It'd be better to have the parties involved in self-help and work it out. Speaking of self-help, the obligor's likelihood of cure is an important factor because it tells us whether or not the obligor is going to work it out or whether they've thrown up their hands and walked off the job, which leads us to good faith. This is a quasi-equitable doctrine, and good faith and fair dealing seems to have a lot to do with it. Whether the parties failed to perform for good reason or for bad reason also factors into our balancing test analysis. Once the court determines that a party is in material breach and has not substantially performed, or for that matter, more importantly, once an attorney giving counsel to its party as to whether or not it can withhold its performance or whether it can cancel a contract, based on whether or not it appears that the other party has substantially performed or materially breached, if the determination is that the party has materially breached, that party may have a right to cure. A party in material breach has the right to cure the breach by substantially performing within a reasonable time. Cure means fixing the defective performance as to make it substantial performance. And when that happens, 
the substantial performance revives the aggrieved party's duty to perform its obligations. However, if that time period expires, then that failure to cure will cause the material breach to become total breach. Total breach gives the other party the right to terminate the contract and look for another contractual counterparty. There is no reviving total breach. It is game over. Restatement section 242 has another balancing test as to whether or not there has been total breach. In determining the time after which a party's uncured material failure to render or to offer performance discharges the other party's remaining duties to render performance under the rules stated herein, the following circumstances are significant. A. Those stated in section 241, which regarded distinguishing substantial performance from material breach. B. The extent to which it reasonably appears to the injured party that delay may prevent or hinder him from making reasonable substitute arrangements. And C. The extent to which the agreement provides for performance without delay, but a material failure to perform or to offer to perform on a stated day does not of itself discharge the other party's remaining duties unless the circumstances, including the language of the agreement, indicate that performance or an offer to perform by that day is important. It's interesting to see how the significant circumstances for determining substantial performance or material breach are also relevant in determining total breach. On the left side are the five balancing test factors for determining substantial performance or material breach. And on the right are the additional two factors added to determine whether or not there is total breach. What do you notice about the factors on the right? They both have to do with time. And of course, the total breach versus material breach distinction is whether or not the period for cure, the cure time, has expired. And we base whether or not the cure period has expired not just on the degree of the breach, but the degree of harm that will result from allowing that material breach to be repaired. It might be that allowing some time for repair of the material breach actually harms the non-breaching party a great deal, in which case courts or attorneys who are advising clients should be more comfortable saying the breach is total and the contract can be canceled. In summary, we have four different levels or types of performance and breach. Each has its own effect. Complete performance absolves the performing party of any further liability discharges that party's further duties under the contract and causes the other party's performance to be due, whether that performance was subject to an implied condition or an express condition. Substantial performance does not alleviate the liability of the performing party. The party is still liable for breach insofar as there, there is a difference in expectation between substantial and complete performance. But under an exchange of promises, the substantially performing party can expect the other party now to perform its obligations. Of course, substantial performance does not satisfy an express condition, but that express condition could potentially be excused by an equitable doctrine. The key point of this lesson, however, was distinguishing substantial performance from the next level down, material breach. A material breach is when the benefit of the bargain was not provided such that the obligor did not fulfill its obligations and does not merit the promise from the obligee. The way to determine whether there has been substantial performance or material breach is to use the test set forth in section 241 of the Restatement Second of Contracts. If we fall into an area called material breach, we must then determine whether the party has time to cure, and the answer to that is found by running the test in section 242, the test for total breach. If the test for total breach comes out and finds that there is in fact a total breach, that is equivalent to saying the cure period is over and the party may terminate the contract. On the other hand, if material breach has not yet evolved into total breach, then that party still has time to fulfill its obligations under the contract.